Good morning. My name is Chris Giles. I'm from the Financial Times. And it's a great pleasure to be here this morning talking about business leadership for positive impact. In fact, there's really not much more in the business world that's more topical in 2019 than this topic. And it feels like it's not just fashion or PR. This is a real change that companies now are solving uh, solving the problems of the world profitably rather than profiting from the world's problems. There's three examples I want to talk about about why it's so topical uh, this year and to demonstrate how important business is taking the issue. First of all, in August, the US Business Roundtable decided they wanted to redefine the purpose of companies saying that no longer would shareholder primacy or just profit maximization be enough. Uh, we wanted to create value for customers, investment in employees, dealing ethically with suppliers, supporting communities, and generating long-term value. All over the world, we've seen in financial regulation, and we have two bankers on the panel here, a move to greening financial regulations and changing financial regulations for positive impact. And in my own organization, the Financial Times, we decided that actually this was a time to say that while we still supported enterprise capitalism, there was a time for a new agenda, and that without change, there was a risk that the prescription becomes much more painful for companies and the world than with change. So today we're going to be talking about putting this, these warm words, if I might say this, into practice and seeing whether there's more behind this than business as usual with a PR wrapping. We have a great panel here. Uh, I'm just going to introduce the panel very, very quickly. Uh, to my left, Mr. Mansour bin Ibrahim Al Mahmoud, the chief executive of the Qatar Investment Authority. Then next to him is Ms. Arancha Gonzalez, the executive director of the International Trade Center. This is an international organization. It's an arm of both the World Trade Organization and the United Nations. Next to her is Mr. Andrew Swiger, Senior Vice President of ExxonMobil. Next to him is Christian Seving, the Chief Executive of Deutsche Bank. And on, for you, the far right, is Tijan Tiam, the Chief Executive of Credit Suisse. Now, Mr. Al Mahmoud, uh, from the perspective of the Qatar Investment Authority, what can you do uh, for positive impact with your funds? Of course, of course, the, um, uh, we're always very thoughtful about our investment. And we would like, to, once we invest in any community, we bring a lot of positive uh, impact to that community. Uh, we have been investing in this regard uh, and deploying a lot of investment. And um, just for your information, Chris, 44% of our infrastructure projects are a zero emission project. And this is shows how commitment are we in terms of bringing a lot of positive impact to the community that we're investing. This is a serious issue that we are we are trying to achieve, and we have been investing a lot in, in companies that are investing in this field. And we are trying to create a strategic relationship with them in a way that we can invest with them in different countries. Lately, for example, yesterday, in the local market, we signed with the Volkswagen an MOU in terms of the research and development for autonomous electrical car that could be used for the public transportation here in Doha. And I think these sort of initiatives are very important that we as a sovereign wealth fund deploy whether internationally or locally uh, to bring a positive impact for the communities. And there's, there's no doubt that one of the big issues for 
the QIA is that its funds come ultimately from people burning hydrocarbons. Yeah. Is there not more you should be doing in that respect? Of course, I mean, from our side, I, uh, there, are, there are two aspects that we are talking about here. You have a fossil fuel producing, and this is, we believe, has to be continued because this is a basic commodities for a global economy. As long as you apply the standard and technology to reduce the emission, but at the same time, sovereign wealth fund, including QIA, has to deploy a lot of investment in terms of investing in social and, and environment projects that will bring uh, a positive impact to, to a global growth. This is a very important issue that we, all of us, government, private sectors, and even everyone in this, in this room should be responsible to this, the issue that we are facing. So all of us has to deploy this. And I think the market is, are full of opportunities right now that you can deploy a lot of investment in this field. Technologies are proven. There are a track record. We are not talking about something which is, have not been used. And there is a decent return in these projects. So I don't see any excuse of not really investing in this field. Um Andrew Swiger, um, your chief executive, Darren Wood, signed the US Business Roundtable declaration in August. How, how does this, do you think, will, how will this change the way that ExxonMobil behaves? I think it's important to, um, to get the proper framework around the discussion because it is very topical. I think a lot of people are attracted by the thematic of business has been pursuing an agenda of profit at, at any cost. And I will tell you, for my corporation, that's never been our thought process. We regard something like that, profit at any cost, as neither acceptable or sustainable. And I seriously doubt that any business that's been around for a long time long as we have been 140 years or even shorter durations, would have found that a proposition where they could have succeeded. But it is topical. And the Business Roundtable statement signed back in August was a fundamental recognition that it's, you have a duty to more than just shareholders. You have a duty to the entire stakeholder collection. That is to say, your customers, your suppliers, the communities, and many others there. We've always regarded that as fundamental to doing it. So the business roundtable for us, and we were one of 181 that signed on to that statement, was really nothing new. It was an affirmation of the way we seek to do business. But again, it is topical. And I think it's, it's understanding the thematic there. So how do we demonstrate leadership in this, the theme of this session? What do leaders do there? We think it's about, in that dialogue with stakeholders, it's about the things that leaders do anywhere. It's about setting expectations, setting standards, and creating clarity on the way forward. So what does that mean? Setting expectations. We establish a new operation, setting clear expectations about what this operation is going to look like, how many jobs it's likely to provide, what the evolution of the supply chain is going to look like, things like that. Setting standards. We have an ExxonMobil and have had for many years, many, many years, a standards of business conduct philosophy. It's articulated in a booklet and so forth. But it's about things like compliance with all applicable laws and regulations. It's about transparency in relationships. It's about anti-corruption. It's about respect for the voluntary principles on human rights. So setting standards is very important. And then the final piece of it, creating clarity. How are we going to progress the dialogue around the expectations of standards? How are we going to make the tough decisions? Because in satisfying a group of stakeholders, it's always about trade-offs and decision-making there. 
So creating clarity about what groups we're going to involve, what the role of government is going to be, what the result, role of cons consultative groups is going to be, what the role of the individual stakeholders is going to be for the long term, because this dialogue will go on for a long ways. It's important. That's how you lead in this space. And I will tell you, if you go to any of our operations, whether it's the newer operations in places like Papua New Guinea or Guyana, we even go to places where we've been for 100 years, the Permian Basin in West Texas and New Mexico, you will see this sort of leadership actively in play. That's what it takes to lead in this area right now. We don't think it's a big fundamental change, but it's important. It also applies to the big global challenges, and I would happily do an, a follow-up on the environment or climate if you'd like, but I'm conscious of the time. Thank you. I, I just want to turn to Ms. Gonzalez. Uh, you head a, a UNWTO agency. Does what you've heard so far uh, sound like enough to tackle the world's uh, challenges, or is it sounding like business as usual with a new wrapper on it? Well, it certainly uh, needs to go beyond business as usual. And uh, to borrow from and, uh, Andrew's uh, uh, statement, I would say it needs to be profit with measurable benefits beyond profit. That's what we're looking for. This is what's at the heart of the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, is the idea that there has to be a compact between public and private uh, to achieve the goals uh, in the Sustainable Development Goals, to achieve eradication of poverty by 2030, to achieve decarbonization of our economies, to empower women economically, to ensure decent work, that all of this is not just simply the task and the job of the public sector, it's also uh, where the private sector has to make its positive contribution. And I think this is uh, what I hear businesses uh, say uh, all around the world. I think the issue we have now is moving beyond individual companies' statements, individual companies' uh, indicators and measures into something that looks a little bit more like system change. Standards that would make it a little bit clearer, transparent, probably easier for businesses uh, to benchmark uh, and measure themselves so that we can, again, invent a new matrix uh, that will give business a clear uh, way to measure how good they are, they are stakeholders and shareholders, a clear measure of how much they are contributing, but also give society uh, also the sentiment that uh, they, in which way they are part of the solution. Thank you. Now, Mr. TM, um, let's get to the nub of the, the, uh, the question here. We, it's very easy for companies to say, that there is no conflict ever between profit maximization and positive impact. But sometimes there is a trade-off. Can you talk to how this trade-off uh, relates to both in your business and the lending decisions that you make? Um, yeah, I think, I think you're addressing a very important point. Uh, as Credit Suisse, we would be very firmly in the camp of uh, saying that ultimately it's a false dichotomy between profit and purpose. Uh, I think as Andrew said rightly, and on the, um, the basis of every business that has been successful in the long term, and Credit Suisse was created in 1856, there is necessarily the belief and the recognition that in the long term, uh, those two are aligned, profit and purpose. Uh, but I would agree with you that in the short term, there are many tensions there that you need processes um, to, to resolve. Uh, and just as an aside, but people have forgotten, Credit, um, Switzerland used to be one of the poorest countries in Europe. Uh, when Credit Suisse was created, it, it was uh, uh, Switzerland had no natural resources, had been exporting people as mercenaries for many centuries, and getting away from the domination of the French banks and the German banks was at the heart of the creation of Credit Suisse to finance infrastructure, uh, link all those valleys, build railroads, um, and make Switzerland what it is today. So it's, it's very much in the DNA of our company to, to do that. Now, to be more concrete, um, what are we doing? Uh, we were very involved in the creation of a green bond market, which is now developing very, very nicely. We did six billion of green bonds 
in uh, 18, we've done 12.4 in uh, 19 and doubling. But more importantly, our, our program is very aligned with the SDGs that um, um, Alantra was referring to. And uh, one idea we're very much promoting is that of uh, transition bonds. Because uh, beyond the wishful thinking, uh, any real transition of the economy will have to be financed. And it's unlikely that it will be financed through fiscal uh, efforts, given the situation we know of most national budgets. So uh, mobilizing private capital, uh, raising private capital in significant, in material amounts to finance a transition is more constructive than, um, if you wish, a blame culture and this opposition between green and brown. We need to turn the brown into green, and that's going to require a lot of resources. So we, we very much believers on that, that we can, we can create um, financing instruments that the financial community can believe in, that will generate good returns, and help this transition of the economy to, to a, a much greener place that we, we all wish for. And um, Mr. Seving, uh what, what do you think banks can do to encourage uh, lending for positive purpose, whether it's green or other uh, purposeful businesses? How, do you need regulations to prod you in that direction, or are you going there on your own accord? Well, first of all, uh, I like the title of, the, uh, of this panel discussion because positive impact is, is something which we as Deutsche Bank have as our branding since, since three years. And why? Because I think that uh, the financial crisis actually has shown that in particular banks went too far away from the society. And whatever we need to do and what we have to do, we must put ourselves into the middle of the society. And then your question comes and I think, as Tijan is just saying, um, the public uh, side cannot finance it on its own. You know, at Deutsche Bank, we have a loan book of 450 billion euros, and step by step, we need to also adjust that loan book into a more sustainable loan book, but that cannot happen from one day to the other. You need the data, you need the experience with that, because as we are saying, profitability versus sustainability it's also an issue that obviously we need to always be risk conscious. We need to make sure that our risk appetite and our standards are in line with that. So to your question, I don't believe that um, with regulatory uh, guidance or with uh, kind of the force of the, of the regulators, we will do the change. Um, I think we need certain parameters. We need a framework what sustainability is all about, what green is, is all about, that must be set so that we can then also collect the data and start actually to uh, um, work within these parameters. But the most important is actually that we provide solutions for our clients that they find it attractive to take certain products in order to finance themselves with that. There is so much like um, environmentally linked bonds that you actually set your own bonds according to certain KPIs. And if you reach these KPIs, um, your yield is going down and there's what you have to pay to the clients. And I think that is the added value what we can do. I think we need to set ourselves standards in the bank. If you have a loan book like, like we have of 450 billion, that a part of that is clearly designed for sustainable financing. And we need to grow it year by year. We need to have, in each and every segment we are financing, we should have um, a green part in that, a sustainable part of that. And why do we need this? Because it's not only in order to finance the public, but as for teachers and as for us in the wealth management, I can tell you the new generation which is coming up, they are looking into the portfolios of their parents and they are deselecting certain portfolios because they would like to have sustainable long-term long-term sustainable products in the portfolio, which we need to generate. And I think we can do it, not only Deutsche Bank, but obviously um, all the investment banks around the world. So it's not only something how to finance, it's also offering products to the new generation that they can invest long-term. That's our task. So what I'm hearing here is that companies off their own back will be doing a lot in terms of positive impact, whether it's for to address climate change or to make society in some sense a better place. 
But we do know that there are short-term trade-offs and there's pressures and tensions and we know that particularly around the world it's very difficult to get agreement on many of these issues. Um, so I want to just explore for a second what is the role of government here to, to prod or to regulate or to ensure that the standards are the same. I just want to get from the, the, from the panel as a whole, where, where do we need either action at the domestic government level or at the international level? Mr. Al Mahmoud. I think the government has a big responsibility. If we are talking about a climate change issue, we admit we have an issue. But I see the model is getting there. It will take time to get there. The, the private sector, sovereign wealth fund, are deploying a lot of money on this. Regulation are easing up in terms of attracting international investors to do project that is focused on environment. But I think the complicated issue is the social aspect. The social aspect in terms of we have an issue, I think the government have not done a good job in terms of the social reform, education, housing, all these aspects that brought a lot of geopolitical issue that we are facing right now. I think, and, uh, and we do not see an improvement in this regard. On the, on the climate change, I see it. I see it, it's moving. I see it, it will, I know it will take time, but I see that there is a deployment in terms of investment. I see project is getting there. Government are really have the mindset to attract this investment. As, as Chris said, I mean, the youth now are very interesting to invest in companies which are labeled with ESG standard. Uh, I attended a workshop, uh, I was informed from a workshop that we have here in the exchange with the CEOs, with the companies who are listed in our exchange. The value of you are labeled as, as, as a ESG standard. It will bring you a lot of international investors who are very interested in only investing in companies who are labeled ESG. So I see the momentum is moving from this aspect. But the other aspect of the social reform from the government is a little bit very complicated, and I do not see the, the, the improvement in this regard. Andy, you, you, your company is, is sort of at the, the, the pivot point of uh, this topic, particularly with global warming. On one hand, we all need energy, we need to, uh, at the moment, we don't have the technology to go on planes or trains without liquid hydrocarbons. Uh, but uh, where does government need to step in? And where do you see the role uh, of government being able to prod you a little bit further or to encourage you to find technological solutions to climate change? Well, I think fundamentally, when you talk about government or governments, which is important when you're running a global business, the role of governments is to take input from all sectors of society, all the stakeholders, and ultimately determine what the general interest is, where the general interest lies. That's evaluating the trade-offs, importantly, the cost benefits, and make wise decisions about what the general interest is, and then prog promulgate the appropriate regulation, incentives, uh, targets, whatever it is, uh, to play in that space there. It's a tough, tough role. It's a really tough role. To, I mean, we live in that world all the time, managing a lot of stakeholders and recognizing that there are trade-offs. As you said, you can't be everything to everybody all the time. Governments, by and large, must step up to that role. Some, are, some do, some don't. It's a difficult thing for politicians to do. It takes a lot of courage. And they often say want what, you to do what the general interest is. They often want you to do lots of things which are not necessarily uh, compatible with your business. Maybe creating well, lots of jobs in a. In a uh... Look, we, 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 provide, we provide input. We talk about cost benefits. At the end of the day, 
We respect the role of governments to make those trade-offs and everything. But they are captive, you know, like many people are, to the latest fads, the, the latest thing that appears on the screen, the latest thing that catches the public attention and so forth. The role really is to stand back, look at that, critically think about it, think about the cost benefits and do it. All we really ask is that we have clarity on the rules, that there is a level playing field for everybody, and that we will respond to those rules, those incentives, whatever they may be, whatever the carrots, whatever the sticks might be, and move forward. It's become much more complicated, as I said, because it's not just government, it's governments and multilateral institutions. You know, things like trade, the WTO, are every bit as important to us as things around climate or other sustainable goals that are being promulgated and so forth. We welcome all of those things. We welcome clarity. We welcome standardization. Most of all, a level playing field. And then we will respond and move forward. As you said, in the area of climate and energy, you know, it's a huge challenge for the world right now. We think it's the biggest challenge. We call it the dual challenge. How do you provide the energy the world needs as it grows to a population between 9 and 10 billion people? As the middle class increases rapidly and as many people are lifted out of poverty, and energy plays a huge role in that. How do you respond to that while at the same time reducing emissions across the board? There are a lot of gaps in the solution set there. A lot of people would like to believe that the solution set exists, and if it is just legislated and benchmarked, and fair, all the pieces are there to solve the problem. But if you believe in the Paris Accord and we support it, and you want to get to a world that's two degrees or one and a half degrees, working those gaps, finding the solutions in those gaps oh. is critically important. That's where we choose to place our focus. Uh, what, what, uh, what is the most important gap that you see well, there, I, I, could, I could go on for a long time, but let me just give you a sort of, sort of one in particular, and you alluded to your comments there. If you look at the data right now about, call it oil use, liquid fuels, you know, the world uses about 100 million barrels a day of crude natural gas liquids and so forth. And if you said to yourself, using the data that the IEA or any number of institutions have out there, and you said, okay, if I electrified all the light duty vehicles in the world by the year 2040, that is all the cars and all the light duty trucks and so forth, if I electrified all those cars by 2040, I said after 2025, every new light duty vehicle has to be electric. 2040, the fleet turns over, everything's electric there. And you said, are you looking at that data? What would the liquids fuels use in the world still be? Well, we'd be back to the levels we were at in 2013, which is about 94, 95 million barrels a day. People are shocked by that. They say, well, if everything is electric, why is, it, why is it still 94, 95 million barrels a day? Well, the answer is, that's just light duty vehicles. There is no solution set yet for heavy duty vehicles, ships, airplanes, petrochemicals. So what do you have to do? You have to work with the solution set there. And the solution set that you know, we're working on that is, how do you develop breakthrough biofuels that are much less carbon intensive and can be dropped into all those applications? That's why we talk a lot about our R&D work in algae, our R&D work in cellulosic. How can you get biofuels with a density that can work in those applications and not impact things like food, land use, so forth. Algae is great because algae is brackish water, sunlight, and CO2 sucked out of the atmosphere. And if it's the case that uh, we are going to be using liquid hydrocarbons for a long time, then I just want to talk to the bankers on the panel. Uh, one of the things we've seen this year is uh, more disclosure for uh, requirements of more disclosure for potentially for non-green assets, talks of green stress tests that your banks will be uh, tested against whether it's effectively you have stranded assets and you've got a lot of money tied up in assets that will ultimately be worthless. 
do you see these these moves as effective or important, Mr. Seving? Well, I think it uh, it increases the debate, and it um, obviously uh, furthermore increases the focus of the management uh, to do this. But honestly, it it is not it is not at the uh, at the force of the regulators to go it via stress test. I can tell you, for three or four years in our annual meetings with our shareholders, 20% of the questions is all about sustainability. What are we doing as the bank to be carbon neutral? What are we doing in order not to finance certain industries? So I think we far more have to listen to the society, to our clients. I can tell you when we are doing pitches in the investment banking for um, top German DAX companies, um, they are actually interested in our solutions, how we can help them in order to go for a sustainable financing for sustainable bond issuances. And I think, therefore, it is absolutely required from a regulatory point of view to provide a framework, to provide parameters. It cannot be that within Europe we have no clarity on this one. It cannot be that within Europe we have two or three major states or countries who are discussing whether nuclear energy is now part of green or not green. That is something which we need to urgently clarify. I think that parameter setting must come from the countries, must come from the regulators. But then driving it, managing it, stress testing it, that's our ultimate task. And we are doing it in particular in the interest of our clients. And therefore, I have no problem with stress testing, but the real impetus is always coming from our side or from our client side. And that's what we have done. Mr. Tiam? Uh, I, I must say I agree with, with Patrick fundamentally. Uh, and I'd like to come back to a point he made earlier, which is that the clients are very much driving this. Uh, Credit Suisse is, is a very large wealth manager. Uh, we are witnessing one of the biggest um, transmissions of wealth in the history of mankind from one generation to another. And the millennials uh, look at these issues completely differently. Uh, they do close accounts um, if you, they think that you don't behave uh, reasonably. Uh, we've created a responsible consumer fund, for instance, and usually successful because it just invests in responsible consumer companies whose practices from the supply chain, the manufacturing, are um, respect international standards. So it, it's a very live debate. Um, I think regulation has a big role to play. Uh, I was fortunate or unfortunate in my life to work both in government and in, a, in the private sector in a small country, but I, I always approach this question of the role of government with a lot of humility. Certainly working in government has been one of the most difficult things I did in my life. Um, you, you, you have to manage those trade-offs between the short term and the long term, try to avoid unintended consequences, which is one of the most difficult things. Uh, provide incentive, but not too much incentive. Provide regulation, but not too much. And um, maybe to make it simple, but it's just, I like sports. If you use a sports analogy, you take football, uh, there has to be regulations so that players can play, but regulators should never try to prescribe which type of dribble is more appropriate in attack or defense, or which type of tackle. It provides the rules. Uh, also, it would be quite ineffective if the rules change during a football game. It would be very difficult to practice good football. So there has to be effective regulation, but stable regulation, without too many um, unintended consequences. One of the biggest worries for me always is not to stifle innovation, because the, the driving force of the economy and this place is innovation, human innovation. So regulation must be careful. Not to, not to jeopardize that. So all I can say is that it's very difficult, but the truth is in the dialogue. Uh, nobody holds the, the truth, has a monopoly on the truth, and uh, the quality and the effectiveness of the dialogue between private and public sector will define the quality and effectiveness of how the system operates in, in the end. There you have it, Arantxa. Uh, working in government is difficult. Uh, you've got to be able to set the rules of the game, set standards, and have global agreements because you can't have different standards in different countries. You represent exactly this in, on the global stage. It's very hard. Is, the, the WTO's had a bad week, uh, not because of the WTO, but because of its members. 
uh, with uh, not being able to agree uh, to keep the appeals panel working so it can't necessarily rule anymore. Where are we in the ability of the world to come up with these global standards that all the people on the, from the business side uh, on this panel uh, has said is so important? Well, this discussion about standards is essentially uh, a discussion about the legitimacy of the capitalist system in which we operate. We should never forget this. Uh, setting the framework conditions for businesses to operate is part of the legitimacy of the capitalist system. So uh, we have to be intelligent. In, I mean, there is no question that we have to do it, I guess. Uh, the question is how do we do it intelligently? In some cases, intelligently will mean basically borrowing from what enlightened businesses would have concocted themselves and making a public policy out of it. In some cases, when there is very little enlightened business, and that also happens, uh, excuse me for saying this, it would be with a, a bigger push on the side of government. But always trying to find a, a framework, setting those framework conditions in a manner that ensures predictability, transparency, and a long-term perspective. Which is precisely why a big part of this discussion has to be how do we do this at the global level. It's nice to do this at the national level, it's great to do this at the European level. Uh, let's think of the, uh, a very important piece of work that Europe is doing, for example, now on sustainable finance taxonomy that it would even be smarter if we could do this at the global level. And this is where the multilateral piece is so important. And this is where, Chris, the World Trade Organization is so important being part of the multilateral piece. It's not about, uh, you know, it's not about defending multilateralism because it is nice to defend it. It's because it is the most effective means to set framework conditions for businesses to operate. If every country now uh, proceeds to set uh, its own border taxes uh, to tackle climate change, it's going to be a mess. What if countries were to uh, deal with this in the Paris Climate Change Accord? Having national contributions to reduce carbon emissions that would basically reduce the necessity for the um, trade sheriff to intervene. So how we do the setting of the framework conditions will matter a lot to the legitimacy and to the effectiveness of the regulatory framework. So let's go back to the good multilateral global table. I know that uh, these days it's not very fashionable to defend uh, global rule making, but I'm going to keep on insisting because having spent 30 years of my life in that business, I see this is uh, still today the most effective one. Just, just to follow up, I mean, we've, we've seen uh, in the multilateral world recently things not being very good. It, climate change is advancing more rapidly than the Paris Accord would like. Trade has been very difficult, even though there's been some slight improvements, but this year has been difficult. International taxation of companies this year, that looked like there was going to be a breakthrough, but now it looks as if it's more likely to fail rather than to succeed at the OECD. Can you give us some positive aspects from the ITC of what you're doing, particularly for small companies uh, around the world in emerging markets? Well, I'll tell you of a good, uh, of a well-kept secret uh, that is happening uh, in Geneva, in the World Trade Organization, where the three uh, big players in international trade, China, US, and Europe, are negotiating an agreement on electronic commerce. Now, they call it electronic commerce, but behind this agreement is data protection. How are we going to ensure privacy of data is protected? cyber security, and obscure things such as uh, validity of electronic signatures and the rest. It's to me one to watch, uh, because if, again, if we are to create framework conditions for electronic commerce, which today, let's not forget, is 14% of international trading goods and growing the fastest, we will need some sort of global regulatory framework. So that's uh, one that is kind of below the radar, uh, 
There is 80 countries in this endeavor. There is uh, only a few countries in Africa that have engaged in this conversation. I think it's very important that every country engages in this conversation because this, if it works, and I hope it does, will be the future framework for, again, the future form of international trade called uh, electronic commerce, which, uh, let's not forget, it's very important for the 99% of businesses around the world which are micro, small and medium enterprises. That's what allows them to connect to international trade, disintermediating uh, as it was in the past. Okay, we've got a few minutes left, so I wanted just to, to move on to a final topic, which is measurement and audit, and how, how you actually demonstrate to the public that your companies are doing what you say they're doing. Uh, it's very important, I think, now that transparency is very important for legitimacy for all of your companies. Mr. Almond, from the QIA's perspective, how can you demonstrate, you've, you've spoken very eloquently about what you're doing and your long-term perspective, but how can you make sure that people will believe it and, uh, and, then, uh, and then ensure that you have legis legitimacy going forward? I think there is no, no, no common standard on this. Each company has its own way of making sure that they communicate this through their own of communication, website, meeting, panel, well, you know, uh, uh, standard of re reporting. And I think this is where we need some sort of a standard between, between the companies and regulation and how to report the EST. It's, uh, it's a self-initiative in, uh, that companies and sovereign wealth funds are taking uh, the responsibility to, to communicate to the public uh, their uh, ESG responsibility. But I think uh, we are lacking in the market this sort of a standard that uh, we need uh, to make sure that each company and each sovereign wealth fund is, uh, we are part of the, of the One Planet initiatives and we are part of the San Diego uh, principle and we are trying to uh, write this standard to make sure that sovereign wealth fund will be able to communicate this in a standard way for the all the stakeholder in the market. Mr. Tiem, uh, audit is hard enough. We've seen lots of problems with audit around the world, and that's just doing the numbers, uh, the financials for a company. How can do you see that it's possible to to demonstrate what you're doing for positive impact? Uh, I, I think it's very important. You're right to underline that, and I, I agree with what Mansour just said. Uh, it's going to be difficult. There's no, no point hiding it. I, I'm very uh, concerned about setbacks because this is a very difficult cause to promote, um, and um, any um, mistake or misrepresentation uh, can be quite damaging. So I think we have to set the bar quite high collectively uh, be very conscious that we're, every time we've come up with an innovation in human history, people try to find a way to circumvent it. So uh, people talk about greenwashing, but it is dangerous. We need to make sure that the concept stays clean. I'm not making a bad, a bad pun, but it stays clean and, um, and keep the standards transparent. And for that, as Arantxa said, it has to be a multilateral, uh, global, global, global dialogue. Well, I think we're now out of time. I think it's it's been a fascinating discussion. There's no question of the importance of positive impact for business with our trade-offs. It's the importance of governments working with the private sector to promote the greater good. Uh, but we also recognize how difficult sometimes th these things can be, particularly in an international context. I'd like to thank the panel very much for a stimulating discussion this morning. And if everyone could give them a round of applause. Thank you very much.